that was that crazy you're on mute hi and welcome to another edition of APDT train your dog month um, tonight I'm joined by Katie Aldridge do you want to introduce yourself Katie and uh, and just let people know what you do a little bit about you yeah okay um hi everyone I'm Katie Aldridge um, I am a dog trainer and a clinical behaviorist as well as a veterinary nurse and I run weekly classes I lecture and I do one-to-one -one sessions with owners as well as running monthly gun dog training workshops and gun dogs are your passion really aren't they tell everyone what dogs you've got yeah. I have Italian Spinonis <laughs> so do feature throughout this you'll get to see some of them <laughs> yeah they are not a small breed of dogs so you can imagine how how much of a house three Italian Spinonis fill up uh but but they're quite they're quite sedate aren't they as a breed they're not too high energy. yeah they can be seemingly so i think sometimes people get them because of that reason but they are really quite good around the house they have their quirks um outside depending on the sort of one you get they can be problematic um but yeah three do take up a lot of one i have had five all together at one point <laughs> excellent so um you're going to be talking to us tonight about focus and engagement games. Do you want to share your presentation and we'll get started? Yeah, let's do the technology. Okay, hopefully that has now shared with you. Perfect. Yeah, I can see that brilliantly. Great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so... I'm going to be talking about increasing focus through using engagement games. Um, and the, the methods that I'm going to be showing you tonight are things that I have used successfully with pretty much hundreds of dogs of breeds or different breeds over the years to increase the engagement back to owners because that is a really common issue. Um, and every dog that you see here um, tonight is either a dog that I've worked with or it's one of my dogs and I'll be showing you some videos shortly so I've already given you a bit of an introduction about myself um, but here is the real blurb I'm a member of quite a few organizations as you can see listed there and one of the things that I forgot to mention is that I do I am also a certified behavior adjustment training instructor and I do help Grisha Stewart um, and do some work for her in her Diamonds Members Academy as well, which is really good fun. So just quickly to talk to you first about what does engagement mean? So what, what do I mean when I say engagement from your dog? We want a dog that's really looking at you when you say their name and that's the first time. It could be very easy to get into that trap of repeating your dog's name because they're ignoring you. Achieving some natural engagement from them regularly on walks, which also begins at home around the house. That can be direct eye contact. It can be coming to you when you call them and also focusing on you during distractions. So why is engagement important? Engagement with your dog is one of the most useful tools that you need for any aspect of dog owner relationship. It's a base for everything that follows, which includes bond and trust. It's also there to help achieve training goals. The training goals you have will vary hugely depending on your level of requirement. So there'll be a real mixture of people attending tonight, potentially from pet owners to training enthusiasts, people with working dogs or dog professionals, and everyone needs engagement to get to where they want to be. Through promoting engagement, your dog will begin to naturally offer those check-ins with you. Um, and that's important because a dog that offers behavior has achieved a stronger skill. Offering behaviors means you're not only prompting your dog, because prompting your dog too often can result in a dog that ignores you, which is the opposite of the goal. And there's strength to any exercise where a dog offers it versus being asked to do it all the time. Engagement also means that your dog is more likely to come back to you when they're off the lead, to ignore distractions, look into you instead, 
and also walk better on the lead, which isn't something we're going to cover tonight, but I'm sure that other members have covered it or will cover it at some point through this month. Without engagement, all of those exercises are going to be more difficult to achieve. So you might be starting asking now, where do you begin? And a really good place to start is a hand touch exercise. A hand touch exercise is what we call a targeting behavior that can be used in multiple situations. It's a really basic exercise that can help also to test out any environment that you might take your dog to. When you take your dog to a new environment, if they can't do this exercise, your training versus the distraction level might not have synced with each other yet, which indicates that you need to do some more training. If they can't do the hand touch, it's um, a good indication. They won't be able to listen to much else that you ask for them. So if you're hoping to let them off lead, they're less likely to come back to you. Or even if you're keeping them on lead, they're, they're potentially more likely to pull. Looking at how well they can do this will help to decide um, how their engagement level is, where it's at. So if they can do the touch, but only if you're holding yummy treats such as chicken or sausage, it could mean they're struggling with the distractions that are present. If they can do it, but only if you're holding standard treats such as generic biscuits, it might mean the distractions aren't too problematic. Or if they can, do this even if you aren't holding treats which is the overall aim like in this picture um, that shows that the distractions aren't really an issue for them we can also look at the commitment to the touch is it really a nose target to the hand to the same standard that you might have achieved in an indoor environment if your dog can't manage a hand touch have you potentially pushed on too quickly which is a common error when training animals and how can you set your dog up to succeed better this exercise is also a really great base for other exercises such as a catch up game. The dog is rewarded for catching up with the owner, which I'm going to go through with you shortly. So now I'm going to play a video for you. Um, in this video, um, you will see I'm doing it with my dog, Oriana, and I am utilising clicker training to indicate of her what it is that I'm rewarding. I'm not going to be going over clicker training tonight again. Maybe someone else has gone through that. So we'll start with the first exercise, which will be hand touch. And these are excerpts took from one of my online courses. So in this first part, I am holding the treats. And this is just what I'd call a standard treat at the moment for her, just to check that she can do the exercise. This environment for most dogs would be sort of a medium to high distraction environment. And then I've quickly moved on to a flat hand, but I am still clicking when she does it and then delivering the reward. So this is what you can do when you first get on a walk, just to see where your dog's at and if they're going to be able to listen to you. This can progress into the next game. Oh yeah, so I'm out of Oriana again and I'm going to do another hand touch exercise to help you with engagement with your dog. So here's Oriana waiting to help. So I'm going to put my hand in the middle, touch. And uh, when she does that, I'm going to throw the treat to the left. I'm going to put the hand back to the middle for her to know Kate. When she touches, I'm going to throw the treat to the right. And this helps to draw them back into you. Um, it's a really good test to do when you first get on a walk to see what kind of engagement you've got from your dog. And if they can't do this really simple game, then they potentially shouldn't even be going off their lead. If you haven't done this before, um, do it on a flat surface because when it's on grass, it can be a bit harder for them to find it. That last treat that you have in your hand, feed to the middle, good girl, so that if you need to, you can get them back to pop them on the lead. So when you get first to a walk, one, two, three, four, five in the middle. So always try and use an odd amount of treats so you can finish off right in front of you. In this next example, it's just a slightly different um, angle so you can see it a bit better. And also in this one, she's being clicked for turning back. So we're really looking for that orientation back to the owner but the treat isn't released until the nose is targeted onto the hand to help create a magnetizing effect to draw her back in. And you can really inject some fun into this exercise. 
On a flat surface, you can also start to throw the food further and further. And once they're really orientating to you well and you know that it's reliable, you can start to begin to add a cue. So in this example, I'm using a whistle and I use three toots of that whistle. So the cue is given to pair that to help teach come. So we're initially using this as a game to teach the orientation back towards you and then turning it into come. In this example, again, the whistle cue is added and it's called scatter feeding because the food is scattered around by my feet, allowing me time to walk away from her. And what I'm looking for is her to look up again and orientate towards me. You can do this with or without the cue. Anytime you practice, it really depends if you want to, if you need to retrain a come cue because maybe you accidentally taught come to mean something different to what you want it to mean, or if you just want to concentrate on the game. Again, for any dogs that haven't done these things before, always start on a flat surface so that they can find the food easier. And you can build the difficulty up as they become more experienced with it and as they start to enjoy the game. This one again utilizes a hand touch. So I'm walking away, click and placing the food down to the floor. When she catches up and targets the hand with that nose, that's where the click is occurring. And I've got another example for you after this view so you can see how it can progress. Nice hand touch. Good. And drop the food down so that I then walk away from her and she has to come and locate me once she's at her treat. Yes, and drop. And I do this to encourage her to maintain the heel position um, unless she's been given her cue to hunt. So I keep my hand out like this. Yes, and drop. And then sometimes I might run away from her. So she really has to catch me up. So I'm teaching her to keep pace with me. Um, and not dawdle and go off doing her own thing. Here she comes. Yes. In this next example, this is about teaching, focusing, and again orientating towards the owner. With um, new dogs, start on the lead when you're outside doing this. When you first progress to outside, you can do this inside first of all. Clicking them for looking and orientating towards you and then placing the food down by your feet. And then you're gonna just slightly move away. And as the dog becomes more experienced with this and is offering better orientation, you can change two things. The first is you can start clicking them or rewarding them for looking up at you rather than just orientating to you. And then as they are getting better at that, you can start to increase the distance that you move and then here, she's just taking a little while to eat a treat. I don't know if you saw that at your end, but she dropped it again. So it is important to make sure that they have actually finished eating when you're doing training before you um, move to the next repetition. So making sure that you're not rushing your training. And again, as your skill increases, you can then progress to off lead in your outdoor environments. This is a really good one to practice in your garden and you can even um, practice this around your house moving from room to room as they get experience, experienced with it with this one you don't want to rush it as you as you see here i'm now moving around behind her so what you don't want to happen is for panic to set in and for them to find you because they're panicking that you've left them so this example is quite a quick introduction if you haven't done it before you would take it a lot slower to make sure that you are building this up gradually um, to keep their confidence throughout the game. Feeding by your feet also ensures that they're driving back towards you, so it has a dual effect of helping with your come exercise. This one's particularly useful for dogs that are really heavy sniffers. 
or lights at home. So any gun dog really, or um, terriers with that really strong instinct. And then making sure that you are feeding to hand, um, again, on your every now and again randomly or on your last repetition so that you can finish the session. And for anyone that's interested, I have created a discount for you if you're interested in seeing where those videos have come from. So that is the last of my videos. I hope you've enjoyed the examples that I've showed you. If anyone, um, I'm sure that we're gonna, me and we're gonna have another chat now, but if anyone wants to connect with me, please feel free to reach out on one of these channels. Perfect. Really enjoyed that. Thank you, Katie. Lots and lots to do. I do lots of hand targeting with my dog, um, but you've like moved it on a gear and incorporated it into lots of other exercises, which is really nice to see. Yeah, Thank you. great. Um, we've got a little question, which I'm not quite sure of. Um, okay. In So I'll pop it up on screen. Um, All right. Yeah. And just says... Do you have recommendations how to stop reactivity, which is restriction frustration with German shepherds? And I've asked the person just to let us know what they mean by restriction frustration. So whether they mean maybe a, it's not a, it's not a term that I've come across restriction frustration, but I'm thinking on lead or barriers. That's where my yeah, mind's going. Like, I don't know about you. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds a bit like uh, restriction frustration is in. It is occurring on lead, maybe versus off lead. Yeah, there's there's quite a lot to unpick there because I mean you can definitely use the examples that I've given to help build resilience to training and teach a dog to focus back on the owner to help cope on walks if that's when it's occurring, or even if it's property um, boundary boundary lines around the property. But really, even the same approach applies, be it frustration or um, fear, you know, dog to dog fear or frustration because of being on lead, you still really want to go down the conditioning route and exposure route um, gradually, which is a, a whole nother sub subject really than what we're going over tonight. So that's a, not a quick question to answer, <laughs> but that person can feel free to get in touch with me for some further guidance if they wish. Yeah, we get a lot of um, like, can you tell me a quick and dirty training tip about how to help my dog that's been practicing this behavior for seven years? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, probably not on a Facebook live, but here's some yeah. little tips. <laughs> yeah. Definitely you can use what's happened, what's been shown tonight, but what you would need to do differently to try and build resilience into it is start with lots of distance with the other dogs there. And that really would be what we'd call your management technique to help you just get past, might not necessarily address the issue, but it might help you be able to actually walk past other dogs. Um, and so, but it'd probably depend on the level of frustration present because if there's lead frustration, it, you won't necessarily want to be using hand touch exercises in case of any redirection onto the handler. Great, perfect. Um, and we did have a live earlier on in the month from our chair, Jane Robinson, the chair of the APDT, and uh, and she did a, a great Q and A with me, and we discussed management and what is management and why is management so important. So, n not allowing the dog or not putting them in a situation where they can practice inappropriate behaviour, behaviour you don't want to see, basically. So, yeah, yeah management perfect. is always going to so, be. Manager would be key in that, yeah. So hopefully that person will go back and watch that one. That would be a good one to watch. Yeah, exactly. Um, and even going back to Emma Hendy's talk that she did yesterday about using lots of parkour and targeting on walks so that the walk is less about we're going for a walk and I don't know what to do versus we're going to go out and do some yeah. parkour and work in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and then or... you're also piggybacking off of exercises that have got a higher reinforcement value to them. Mm. So it makes the walks more enjoyable rather than the dog losing, losing control of themselves. Yeah, great. So hopefully that's answered your question a little bit. But sometimes when you ask a question, it actually makes us ask you more questions than yeah. you asked us. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, Rachel has just said, really enjoyed this. And even though I teach touch and recall, um, it's nice to add in even more targeting and focusing and recall to touch. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I um, yeah, think. I think hand targeting and touch is one of those things that you as oh 
you as like a, a side effect of teaching it, you get a fabulous recall because this really visual cue to the dog, just come and touch my hand for a treat, hasn't been punished in the way that a recall has, which is come back and I'm going to put your lead on and we're going to go home. Yeah. Um, I I kind of touched on that slightly during the talk, but yeah, I mm. kind of hit a little bit about poison cues. It's really in, a common one, especially with pet owners. They do that very commonly by accident uh, because of, for example, calling in the back, putting them on the lead straight away. Um, or if you keep asking your dog to come and they're actually running away from you, there is that risk that come actually means run away from you, not run to me. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing the things that we teach dogs inadvertently, isn't it? And it's usually trainer error, user error. The dog's just doing yeah. what they think is right and what gets them reinforcement. Um, but yeah, I'm going to teach, yeah. teach you to run away from me. Um, and yeah, Rachel just said, yeah, easy to poison a recall. Just check in for any more questions in the chat. We haven't got any more questions for now. We've got lots of people watching. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to add about focus and engagement games? Is it something that you play with your dogs a lot on walks? All right, yeah, it's something... I think the more you practice these things, they should really become part of your normal daily life. Um, like with any habit, the more you practice, the more you practice something, the more it actually just becomes a way of life. And you can provide reinforcement in many different ways. So I've just touched on that a little bit. In the scenario of the poison cue, the reinforcement for that for the dog is running up to another dog or sniffing it, sniffing something, which is why it becomes, it, it still has meaning that word, but not what we think it means. Um, so the more you do it, the more you should find your dogs just looking, looking at you generally throughout the day. And there's always opportunity to just give them praise or to stroke them and touch them. Um, really important, I think, when you're out on walks, even on lead walks, anytime you see your dog looking at you, reward them in, in whatever form that you can. If you haven't got treats, just talk to them, stroke them. Um, because we've all been in a situation where we've potentially had a dog that's got issues on a walk or we've been that walker walking past a potentially another dog that's got an issue. And if you can get your dog to just be looking up at you, it just helps the scenario from both points of view. It helps your dog cope with that situation and it potentially helps whatever the distraction is, be it, you know, a child on a bike or or that dog that doesn't not have a dog. It just really helps that, that other scenario as well. So, yeah, it's something I do all the time. And my youngest dog is seven and um, training never stops, does it? I always say it's like having a car. You need to maintain it. If you don't maintain it and... Um, you know give it a service give it its, you know put fuel in the tank then you will it will become weak so um yeah definitely <laughs> yeah it's like um you kind of you, you you go through the puppy training and you get them through their teenage phase which can be trying um and then you're mm. like oh i've got a nice dog now i can kind of stop training but they still want to do stuff and i've got a seven-year-old dog as well and she's like as soon as I get my treat pouch out or as soon as I go anywhere, you know, pick up a clicker or something, she knows and she's like, OK, I'm ready. I'm, can we do some training? And her brain is still really, really active, even though she might be considered like yeah. a senior dog now. So, um, yeah, the joy they get from training makes it all worthwhile, I think. Um, Definitely. I'm, Paul's just asking, hi, Katie. I'm seeing quite a few dogs today. Um, lately with zero interest in treats, even high value ones in training environments. Any tips with this? Got to leave for dog training, so we'll watch later for a response. Thank you. Um, so what, no, obviously you can use other reinforcers, so you need to potentially tap into what breed of dog they are, what reinforcer is more um, important to them. However, normally if a dog isn't taking food, it's because they're too overstimulated so um, they are potentially in an environment that isn't suitable for them to do that training in right now. Um, so you really need to get that strong base and to do preference testing with your, with your reinforcers, not only with food, but let's say we pick three different types of food, like really high value ones for dogs like that. 
do a preference test in your at home. Are they eating it at home first of all? If they are, then test it when you first come out the front door. Are they still eating there? If they are, and then you move further into your walk and they stop eating, it is stimulation from that environment that's potentially suppressing their appetite because of the overstimulation. And then you can also do preference testing with different like toy items um, and things like this. So um, dogs that are toy motivated are still going to prefer one type of toy over another. So maybe getting three to nine different toys and just showing them one at a time and seeing what toy the dog naturally orientates to. So there are other ways to do it. Obviously using food does help normally to accelerate the learning, um, but not always short and smart sessions can be the way forwards in that sort of situation but i would definitely be looking at um dogs like that to check for any other underlying things that are going on like maybe some anxieties or gun dogs can quite often be like that they've got their hunting nose in and all they want to do is go and hunt so you really um have to get on top of that um i found clicker training to be really useful with that so once they've been conditioned to the clicker, that tends to start getting dogs to eat food in situations where they normally wouldn't have before. So there are a few ways around it. Yeah, I think with the with the clicker, when you start using a clicker, it always almost becomes a kind of, oh, I've heard that noise, that means I must eat. And it's just something that comes over yeah. them like, okay, I'll take the treat. A lot of the time anyway. Yeah, um, yeah good, I've but... definitely experienced that quite a lot as well. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Katie. That was a really, really lovely talk. Yeah. Um, you've given people your website and we'll pop a little um, comment underneath the live so that they can get in touch with you. Um, we just had a little final comment from Barbara saying, my dogs are nine and three, nine year old just so. And she's still happy training, I'm guessing, Barbara. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thank you so much, Katie. It's brilliant. Really, really enjoyed hearing about that. Um, and tomorrow we have got a talk on, kind of a bit relevant for the moment, I feel, as well, with what's gone on in the news and stuff, dogs and horses, safety tips. So um, mm. tune in, tune in for that tomorrow at six. Thanks very much and have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening.